Hey everybody, I do have things to plug, but I was on the road all day and I didn't get anything written up. So um, download the Postmates app and use the code BITS to get 50% off your first five orders of $50 or more. And that's all I got to say about that. Pretty excited because uh, uh, this guy is really like blowing up TikTok and I haven't talked to anybody really specifically about TikTok, so I, I can't wait to talk to him. Um, his name is uh, Jeff Plitt. He is a stand-up comedian and writer based out of L.A. And he's been on all of L.A.'s big stages like the Improv, the Comedy Store, West Side Comedy Theater, and Upright Citizens Brigade. Um, one of the neat things about Jeff, though, is he is schooled to be an engineer and worked as an engineer for Google. So I want to talk about that because I bet he has some information on KPIs that we could talk about. Um, Jeff, Jeff has uh, performed at the Ventura Laughlin, Ventura, Laughlin, Toronto, and Chicago Comedy Festivals. He is the co-founder of Peachy Keen, a weekly stand-up comedy showcase that's been a staple in the L.A. comedy scene for over six years he doesn't even look old enough to be doing comedy for six years. He's uh, worked with Sarah Silverman, Kevin Nealon, Fred Armisen, Jeff Garland, and Dimitri Martin. He was in the last episode, the final episode of Hannah Montana, uh, playing opposite uh, Miley Cyrus and Jay Leno. And his um, first feature film, Paranormal Whacktivity, can be seen on Netflix and iTunes. And... As I mentioned, Jeff has become a TikTok phenom with almost 111,000 followers as of 10 minutes ago. Maybe we'll get, get him over the 111,000 mark with this. But uh, let's bring him out right now with uh, talking about what you need to know and everything else. It's Jeff Plitt. Jeff, thanks for being on the show. Hello, good to good to be here, Scott, and uh, and good to uh, be with all of your listeners. Uh, I'm excited to to get into this with you. So, the first thing I want to say is I've watched some of your clips from a while back, and I've I see you now, and you look really different with glasses. <laughs> yeah, I, I, just, and I, no I, facial hair. No, I yeah, I used to have a beard. Yeah, you you kind of you kind of had uh, and don't take this the wrong way, kind of a Jeremy Piven look, and now you have more of uh, the guy that was uh, uh, doing the Verizon commercials look a little bit more now. You look younger now than you did then. That's what I'm trying to say. Oh, good. Well, I'm yeah. button. I'm aging in reverse. Yeah, yeah, and I'm aging uh, accelerated, so uh, so that's that's great. I, I really appreciate you being on the show. I do want to I, I want to get into how you are putting yourself out there and how good you are at it, but I do want to talk a little bit about your origins because going to school to be an engineer and working for Google, that's definitely right brain type stuff. And now you're into comedy. So how did that all come about for you? You know, I've been doing both since I was a little kid. Uh, when I okay. was four years old, I started doing theater plays. Um, mm -hmm. I've been acting in some way, performing in some way, shape or form since then. I, I just did a ton of theater and then improv sketch and now stand up is my focus. I also, uh, I started programming computers when I was 11 years old, and uh, my dad also does that and so it sort of showed it to me. But I was doing it as a hobby, and then it became clear, like, okay, this is a lucrative thing, and I, my heart's not, like, I'm not in love with it as, like, my life's passion, but mm -hmm. I'm good at it, and it's, it, it's a good living, um, and also it's just like, it, it, my brain likes it. It's a puzzle. And yeah. uh, so I've always done both of them. I don't really combine them. I consider them mostly separate. But mm -hmm. I would say that I think um, the the technical, the, the, the engineering mindset of problem solving, it has given me a unique approach to comedy because I tend to, I want to take things apart and put them back together. I want to mm -hmm. learn how jokes work. I, I remember that one of the first breakthroughs I had with stand-up, because um, uh, when I first did stand up, I was terrible. I did it probably 20, 30 times and didn't get any laughs, didn't feel good at it. But I was like, I think there's something here. And then I, I had this breakthrough when I read a book uh, that where this woman had taken all of these classic stand up bits by like Seinfeld and Ellen. This was 
several years back, but mm-hmm. um, now they would use different comedians, but she had written them down and I'm a visual learner. I need to read something to really understand it. And so by reading those bits, I've been laughing to them when I was hearing them, but by reading stand-up comedy, um, I finally saw the patterns and was able to sort of take it apart, put it back together. And so mm-hmm. I guess I've always been a very, very organized and, uh, and left brains comedy writer. You know, I use spreadsheets and Google Docs and uh-huh. uh, and all that when I when I approach comedy. There, when you see things transcribe like that, you, you do notice because I've done a little bit of that myself. I'm I'm taking a class where they require us to do it, and you you see a rhythm. It's almost like looking at musical notes on the page because there's a beat. You know, there's a there's like a three four beat to it, and that's that's how you know the laugh's going to come here. Set up, laugh. Yeah. Set up, laugh. Yeah. And even, and you can do it even if you're telling a story, as long as you put the proper tags in it. So you can, you can do that as long as you keep the amount of laughter up to the point where they're still listening to you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, thinking about the actual, getting into comedy did you have anybody that you admired uh that really kind of shaped the way you wanted to do comedy to start out well i think at first i was just aware of some of the big famous ones and my style isn't anything like these guys but Seinfeld, hmm. eddie murphy uh, maybe uh um uh also stephen wright really short um uh, mitch hedberg mm-hmm. like short jokes and i tend to write really short jokes um, but these days, uh, my influences, if I was to say my favorite comedians, they're, you know, some of the ones that maybe my parents wouldn't recognize these names necessarily, but I think comedy nerds would, I, I really like, uh, Sebastian Maniscalco, Brian Regan. I also mm-hmm. like, um, Brent Weinbach and, uh, and, and, uh, Matthew Broussard, mm-hmm. uh, Dimitri Martin. Um, so those are a lot of my favorite. Mm-hmm. Thinking about how I discovered you, it was really, I followed you on Instagram and then you sent me a note saying, Hey, do you want to subscribe to my email? And I subscribed to the email and I read it every week or however, however many times you send it. Um, And one of the things I was really impressed with is I subscribed to a lot of emails from comedians and uh, musicians and other folks like that just because I want to see how they do it so I can rip off all the good ideas and use them myself and one of the things that I really liked about yours is it's super succinct you put a very little blurb about you know follow me on social media follow me on TikTok and all that kind of stuff and then you usually put three different uh comedy bits on there there'll be like from the roast, the Comedy Central roast, and SNL and stuff like that, and then you'll pop in a uh, stand-up set. And I really liked how you did that because there wasn't—I didn't have to read a lot. There wasn't a whole book of stuff, and I could click on the one I want to watch and and be done with it. But your name is on it, and that's that name recognition was really what impressed me because it's in the subject of the email. So it just subliminally goes back here, and then when you hear that name, oh yeah, I know Jeff. Thanks. Yeah, but my, my newsletter it was, it was just something random I decided to do during the pandemic and keep going. You know, once a week I just share other people's videos. It's not mm-hmm. kind of about me. I put I put a few of my links at the top as you said, but I mainly make the newsletter about other people. I mean, part of mm-hmm. that was I just realized there's really not that big of a market yet for people that that want a newsletter all about my latest stuff. And I figured there'd be a much bigger interest if I made it. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's it's a weekly newsletter. It, you can look on it online on, as a blog, but it also comes into your inbox if you want. And it's usually about four YouTube videos, things like uh, a stand-up clip from, from Comedy Central, uh, mm-hmm. uh, a sketch from Saturday Night Live or something. So it's premium comedy. And mm-hmm. then uh, at, in tiny ways, I put a couple links to my own things. So by doing this, uh, I realized I can I can give back to the comedy community. I put quotes around it because I invented that later. I mean, it's it's a selfish thing. I'm really trying yeah. to get my own links out there, but I realized, oh, you know, I'm already watching this stuff. I might as well save it and share it with other people. Right. And so I think that that selfless vibe that it has 
helped it to take off. It's now like maybe 800 subscribers. Um, uh -huh. And so, yeah, just just slowly but surely, I, I, I am trying to make my own name by exposing the world to all of my friends and favorite comedians as well. Mm -hmm. And and I really, like I said, I just really like the way you put that together because it's not it, it's not anything that takes a terrible amount of energy for me. And yet there's your name and there's your name again. So it's really it, it's really a great way to do it. And I do you know, I get some emails from folks that are, you know, it takes me 20 minutes to read the whole thing. And it's mostly about their life. And like us, we're, I don't want to know about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, have no, I, have, I have really no interest in reading random prose from somebody. Uh, I don't even read that many fiction books. I'm a big nonfiction reader, and I read uh, yeah. uh, a lot of news and this and that. But it's, a lot of people's newsletters, I'll look at it, and it's just 10 paragraphs of like, when this happened this week, and then I, I thought about this. And I'm not going to read paragraphs and paragraphs of text from someone who isn't a, a famous writer. I'm just, I just don't have the patience. So, yeah, I keep it quick. And I, I'm glad you admire it. I, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And one of the things, uh, you know, I took a, a page out of your book when I started the podcast because I, one of the things I very much wanted to do is make it not about me. I don't want it to be anything about me. So I didn't put my picture on the, uh, the artwork or anything like that. And when I put it out, it was just called Behind the Bits. And I had one comedian, I think after I interviewed him, say, you have to make it behind the bits with Scott Curtis because you are a comedian. So you need to get your name out there and you need it for the SEO and all that kind of stuff. So then I finally caved in. And I said, behind the bits with Scott Curtis, but you know, on my episodes, you won't hear me doing like a, um, a big, uh, uh, intro about my life. I go right into the interview and then, and that's all you get. Um, you know, I think that's the magic of branding, Scott, is that the, the when you create, a, you know, for you, it's behind the bits. That is now a personality. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a character. It has a unique mm -hmm. name. It has almost its own face to it. And, you know, you're along for the ride. And what you might find is that behind the bits can go much further than than just Scott ever could. But you get to ride that whole all the way there. So I think right. I think branding is. Uh, is really cool because it almost invents an, uh, an invisible or fake person that you can get behind. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking about branding, because this is, this is so current and I'm like on this total rage against Spotify and, and you're out in LA talking to a lot of comics and I'm sure some of them got their albums pulled from Spotify. I, uh, I, I did a, just like a five minute rant that I, uh, uploaded impromptu last week about it and imploring people to use any other streaming service except for Spotify. And coincidentally, all the Spotify raps were coming out. So it was all over Twitter. So I tried to get the hashtag Spotify craft uh, going and it, it didn't go very far, but I, I had a couple people message me and say, okay, I'll stop using Spotify. What, what, kind of uh, opinions are you getting from your comedian friends about the whole Spotify thing? Yeah. So for those people who don't know, um, a, a rights organization that essentially collects uh, royalties on behalf of people who have comedy content on Spotify uh, is basically getting a divorce with Spotify. They're basically yeah. fighting. It's a contract dispute. And so in the meantime, Spotify took down these, these albums and overnight, there was this big uproar because all these people, the comedians themselves as well, as well as their fans said, why is my album not on Spotify anymore? I can't stand when these companies do this. I mean, for me, I remember, I think it was HBO and um, maybe it was my Chromecast or my Fire TV were having a divorce. So I couldn't watch my HBO on my, on my Amazon Fire. Yeah. And, and my whole thing is like, even if you can't figure out how much each side is going to pay the other or whatever, like let the, let the users, let the customers, you know, get what they want. Mm -hmm. And you can postpone that and figure that out later. At least I think I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I haven't yeah. heard anything uh, myself um, about it. I don't know why, but I I've seen stuff online as you have, and it's a it's a low down, dirty shame. And I hope they figure it out soon. 
Yeah, and the the thing is, is they pay the least out of just about everybody per stream. And I have a lot of musician friends as well as comedian friends. And if I'm going to support them in any way, I'm going to move over to a service that actually pays them more per stream. So I went over to Tidal, and they pay them like four times as much as as Spotify does. So That's you great. know, yeah. I remember yeah. uh, when when Adele was in the news last week for getting Spotify to remove the play button uh sorry the shuffle button from albums which, uh-huh. which i guess i remember uh, i wrote a joke that you know someone from spotify said oh we were glad to do this because at first we thought that she was asking us to pay our artists fairly and we're never going to do that yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man i and when you're the when you're the giant you can get away with it but you know hopefully little by little people will start to see that uh, they're not the only one out there because titles are getting pretty good and they sound a lot better they they use original masters so everything sounds much nicer well guys you heard it here first jump on title because scott scott knows what he's talking about yeah <laughs> so thinking about your you know i in watching your clips I, i'm bouncing around a little bit but in watching your clips you you do have a um a super self-deprecating uh, sense of humor as well as I really like the wordplay and, and, and things like that. How long did it take you? You said you were failing so much. When did you finally see the light and figure out how to make this stuff funny and uh, be able to get an audience on your side? Well, and, and, and when you say clips, you're talking about the TikToks, right? No, actually, I've been watch, I had been watching your stand-up clips. Oh, interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Stand up is a really long process. I I think that for the first two or three or four years, I was just scrambling to find any jokes that were even remotely funny. And I just put them in random order in my sets. I was getting up on stage anywhere I could. The, the just, you know, you're, you're always getting on stage anywhere you can. But I mean, these were these were bringers and these were just the loud, noisy bars and and it, it definitely was just a process of, I only probably wrote two or three new jokes per week. I probably only had uh, one, one new keeper for, for every couple months or something. So it just took a while. But when I mm-hmm. finally felt that, uh, confident was in my, maybe my fourth year of doing stand-up, I, you know, and then I'll tell you what happened after that. But um, just to survive, I think, uh, you know, doing bits as, as many places as you can, having a buddy to bounce things off of, and then mm-hmm. eventually that became um, producing a show. And when I started producing a show, um, that one you mentioned, Peachy Keen, and it, I've, I've had a couple different, like it changed names to Jetpack, and then now I'm, I'm producing at the same place. It's called uh, Totally. Um, it's a different night. But mm-hmm. what I found is by running a show, um, you get a certain currency. Now, now, there's a lot of people that met me just because I booked them on my show, and mm-hmm. their first impression of me is, oh, this guy's a booker. Um, mm-hmm. And so for, uh, for a long time, my challenge was to be worthy of even being on the same stage as the people on my show. So mm-hmm. at first, I felt like I wasn't at all. I hosted the show. In mm-hmm. L.A., it's different than in, in a lot of other cities. But, it, but in L.A., um, you know, hosting is uh, not, not as desirable as the other positions on a show. So it's better to go up later, I guess. Mm-hmm. So for, for a while, I just took the bullet. And for a couple of years, I just hosted um, – and, you know, I, besides introducing the acts, I got to do my 10 minutes. I got better and better. And at some point I felt it was like a year or two in, I felt like, okay, I think I can go somewhere in the middle of this show. And, and now I feel about as strong as, as, as most anyone else that's on the show, except uh, maybe some, some huge uh, names that we get. Um, yeah, I had Bill Burr walk in and do a, a set on my show about a year ago. Wow. Uh, Mind blowing. And uh, yeah, we've had some great great comedians but i think doing a show it's not so it's definitely not directly trading spots once in a Mm -hmm. while i i I do a show and i'm like oh yeah i guess i guess that person asked me to do the show and and i asked them to do my show but it's usually because uh they really were good for my show and i wasn't thinking that they run a show and i never trade spots i think that's weird but Mm -hmm. i think doing a let me put it this way when you when you run a show and you have people on that's a chance for them to see you and discover that, oh, this guy does do comedy and, and see what you do. And so mm-hmm. after a while, I would have occasional, occasionally comments would go, hey, that's a good joke that you have, blah, blah, blah. And I realized this is a great fast forward way to build a network. And so mm-hmm. um, I think that's one of my top tips is um, if you're not getting enough stage time or if you, if you want to take the next level, try, try running a show. You'll actually learn a lot, I think. 
for example, some people don't know how to be a good MC or they don't know uh, how to like set up, uh, you know, how, how the lights or the music should be. Once you run a show, you have to learn that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's not as important as the actual comedy, but it's just part of the toolbox, you know. And how did you learn it? How did you learn how to set up a room? <laughs> I mean, trial and error, man. I, uh -huh. I, I, I think I would, I, once you, once I started running a show, I started noticing much more when I don't, when I was at someone else's shows, Oh, instead of like one crappy led light, they have several warm, soft, uh, sort of more golden, uh, uh, you know, lights and mm -hmm. uh, oh, the, uh, the, the, the density of the chairs matters and how close they are to the stage matters. And you want to darken the rest of the room and make the stage, you know, light. But I, I've grown up in theater. I was aware of lighting and seating and all those things. But mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm also a filmmaker, which is sort of leading towards the, the TikTok stuff. Mm -hmm. And as a filmmaker, I learned a lot about um, lighting and cameras and lenses and all that. And you just start to develop the eye. And these are things that did not come naturally to me. They came because I gave myself a challenge. Just mm -hmm. like how instead of going to film school, I would advise anyone to take that money and spend it on making short films um, with, with stand-up instead of, um, I mean, take a class here or there if you, if you want, maybe an improv class, a stand-up class, whatever, but also think about just uh, producing shows because you start to learn so much more about, about comedy. Also about marketing, about audiences, like starting mm -hmm. to realize um, which kind of comedians bring audience, put butts in seats and how often you can bring them back and how to how to reach audiences, whether it's on social media or building an email list. We do all these things just to have a normal amount of people in the room. We have to do you know tons of work on the backside to market the show and keep people coming back. You know, mm -hmm. what kind of comedians put butts in seats right now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's some some very obvious ones, the ones that have a lot of credits and and uh, and are famous names. But aside from that. What I find is there's there's a bunch of interesting niches. So um, one thing that's really important for me on, on my show is diversity. So we definitely make sure that we have female voices, people of color. Um, it's not only to to look good and, and look like you're you know you're you're being woke or something. It it literally makes the room more interesting. And this diversity of voices just makes you feel like you're really much more in touch with the pulse of, of America, what's going on in the world. So mm -hmm. um, I've found that there are certain niches like that 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 put butts in seats. I mean, there might be for every white guy that you can book, that's kind of got some buzz. There's, there's always, you know, um, a, a female comic or an LGBT comic or someone who's, um, uh, let, you know, like really, really young or really old or something, you know, and, and or a combination of those things. And so it's, it's very um, interesting to have a huge amount of diversity. So, I mean, we had uh, Joel Kim booster. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's uh, he's, he's gay he's asian and he's hilarious and he packed mm -hmm. our it was a it was a great show mm -hmm. and we're always experimenting and 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 the other thing is you have to ask audience members as they come in hey, who'd you how'd you find out about the show who are you here to see so that you get that market research for free you know mm -hmm. that's 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 great and, and the fact that you're doing the diversity thing and almost because you know it works you know it's 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 so funny because it's so hard to get white guys to understand uh why to do something and one thing you can do is what you just said hey it works because it makes the room better then maybe white bo white guy bookers will start actually getting some more diversity in their shows yeah and it's it's beyond even just let's say even amongst uh, when, whenever a white guy does do your show, uh, how about not booking the most fratty, you know, bro -y, uh, uh, <laughs> dude that you can find? How about the, the thoughtful ones, the interesting ones, the ones yeah. that are, that are, you know, just diversity in every, in every, in every way I think helps, but also mm -hmm. just, you know, just, just funny. I mean, we're, we're, I, every time someone submits to my show, uh, I watch their video or at least the first minute. Um, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of submissions, but, um, being aware of who's doing what there i can't tell you how many times someone submitted and i went mm, i don't know if they're right for this show i don't know if they're gonna gonna be great and then they take off and they have a huge career yeah. uh that's light years ahead of mine so <laughs> uh, become really humble and um yeah it's really hard to because i uh i've looked at tape for different shows and it's really hard to get the whole comedian from just like a YouTube video. It's really, it's really hard to understand how, 
because the sound's never quite right and sometimes you can't hear the audience. I, I had one person s send something to me and I actually had to download it and um, put it into my processor in order to see if anybody was actually laughing because it was mic'd so poorly and people were laughing. So it's, it's, it's funny how uh, it, it is hard to get that. And that's why it's important kids uh, when you put your tape out there to pick a good tape and uh, try to get somebody to do it professionally for you if you can, because that's much better to put around than that. So I know some folks say cell phone video is fine, but it's, uh, it's, it's fine as long as you can see the person and hear the laughter. That's the important part. Well, my suggestion for taping um, it took me, well, first of all, you have to shoot a ton of tapes to get a good one. If you want mm -hmm. one tape, you should shoot 10 times. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would say get a, get a camera, probably one of these newer blogger cameras that are really high quality, but not too expensive. Maybe spend mm -hmm. uh, seven, $800. Um, but you need a good lens. Uh, here, here's, here's the main problem with these iPhone cameras. Even though all of the camera and every, all the stuff on it is really good, the one thing they don't do, they don't zoom in real deep. Mm -hmm. And you can't put the camera, whenever you're taking pictures of your friends for like uh, just a normal photo or something, you're three, five, you're maybe five foot away. But mm -hmm. at a comedy show, you're 20 to 30 feet away and you're teeny tiny on the screen. So that's why mm -hmm. I say get like a, get one of these blogger or, or DSLR type cameras because you need a lens that's going to go something like a hundred, a hundred millimeter, millimeter or 80 millimeter lens. Uh, so that's kind of what I bring to a show is a tripod camera, long lens and a, a nice mic because that's the only other thing that's important is because the microphone that's inside of an iPhone or inside just built into the camera is terrible. So right. as long as you have, it's really the lens and the microphone that's the most important part. And mm -hmm. a good lens needs to, you can't put it on an iPhone, so you need a camera to put it on. So really, to me, the most essential part is the lens. <laughs> and then you need, the camera because you need the lens. But that, that's, that's really what I recommend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's let's get into this TikTok thing. I know you were probably taking swings at social media before TikTok started or before you got on TikTok. How did you do it? So this is the story behind this. Um, I stand up was going uh, decently well, but uh, other comedians and people were telling me, you know, Jeff, you're, you're a pretty good writer. I feel like you could be a joke writer. And I I took that seriously. I wanted to do it. I started um, I have a friend, I've, I have several friends that are in late night and mm -hmm. my, my one friend, uh, Nick Vaderot, um, I've known him for years from the Chicago scene and he's a writer on, uh, Mar and, uh, also he has a, he has an album coming out, uh, in like a couple weeks. He's hilarious. So check him out. Nick Vaderot. He said, mm -hmm. read this book. And so I read this book by Joe Toplin. Um, it's called, uh, where is it? It's called comedy writing for late night TV. Mm -hmm. And it really opened my eyes to how to write the kind of jokes that Letterman, Leno, or, or Kimmel, Colbert tell on, on television. You know, the, mm. the, the, the 10 minute opening chunk where they're doing monologue. And it's always news headline, which they read totally normal, no, no jokes in the headline, and then punchline, maybe one or two punchlines, and then new news headline. So mm. it's very different than stand up. Let's look at how it's different. It's disposable. These jokes you can't tell after a few weeks, they get pretty stale. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, there's a lot more uh, setups. So as a comic, of course, you're looking for punchlines. But if you have writer's block, if you don't even know what kind of topics um, that that you want to try finding punchlines for, th then that's real writer's block, right? So sometimes I'm just looking for setups. Like sometimes I'm, I'm driving and I'm thinking, what topic should I get into? Uh, I'm just looking around going, maybe I should do something about cars or Uber or whatever. It's hard to find topics for, for stand-up for me sometimes. And but it's a lot. It's very easy to write news jokes in this way because there's 40 great headlines every week. So I got a news feed and I started doing that. This is well before TikTok. This is in 2018. I just started writing them. And um, I, I, at some point, I finally met this uh, manager who sort of helped me to submit to, um, to be a writer on one of these late night shows. I'd still like to do it. I've never gotten accepted, but I have gotten them read and I've gone through some submissions processes. Anyway, I was doing this and mostly just tweeting them out and no one paying much attention. And the pandemic hit and stand up was done. I didn't want to do stand up on, on Zoom, really. And I didn't want to mm -hmm. do it in the park. I mostly was just on pause with stand up. But I said, oh, you know what? I'm a filmmaker and, and I, I'm always writing these news jokes. Why don't I film the news jokes? So 
I tried it in May. I, I think I remember March was the first time we locked down. And by May, I was filming these, these news jokes in my apartment and putting them on TikTok. And I had some early successes, like right from the beginning, I had two or three that went to a million views. And I mean, I, I don't, I don't have a humongously rabid fan base on any other platform. I do. Okay. I don't think it's the, um, I don't think I'm, I'm, uh, I think TikTok is a unique platform where ideas succeed even more, uh, especially for new people. It's easier to start new and fresh and build something new, easier than on YouTube, in my opinion, uh, than anywhere else. But um, I think the reason I I do well on TikTok is is the writing. I don't, I don't think people are just in love with me as a person. I think it's like they're here for the jokes. And that's what mm -hmm. I give them. My TikTok videos are very short. It's often 15 to 20 seconds at the max. Sometimes they're 10 mm -hmm. seconds. It's a quick headline and one punchline and I'm done because they're short. I can do a ton of them. So this is the right. theme of my process is uh, quantity will lead you to quality. Yeah. <laughs> With these jokes, I end up putting out about 30 per week on, uh, or uh, let's say 20 per week on mm -hmm. uh, TikTok. I actually have a spreadsheet where I collect about 30 headlines per week. And I write a bunch of those punchlines and I bounce them off some friends. I, I have one friend who, uh, Con, con, you know, contributes uh, to those, and I have a couple other friends who also contribute. And uh, eventually, I whittle down and eliminate a lot of them. And finally, I film about about twenty, and uh, and then I, I put them on. I mean, there's no way you can put out twenty videos a week unless they're all you know fifteen seconds long. Right. So um, right. that's how I get that pace. And the good thing is, uh, TikTok. You think, oh well, if it's if 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 this guy's got sixty second videos and Jeff's got fifteen second videos, well maybe Jeff's will, will only do twenty five percent as well. Well, no, actually, I can fit four videos into that same sixty seconds, and I have four shots on the goal, four attempts to go viral. Yeah, so, uh, I think shorter videos are better, and uh, I just kept increasing the production value. For a while, I was just doing it um, in this dark area of my apartment. Then I got better lighting and a fake brick backdrop, and now I have a full green screen you know, set up and it looks like I'm in front of, um, Austin, Texas, uh, skyline. And yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's come a long way. Um, and I, I, it, it wasn't an overnight success. I've gotten to the current level of followers by just individual viral videos. And, uh, and, uh, you know, let me know if you have any more questions. I can go more into the, more into the process. Of yeah. And w one of the things that is a common theme with you is that you, you didn't start out viral and you didn't start out with uh, all that many followers, but you kept at it. And the same thing with the comedy, same thing with the newsletter, just everything, everything you do, you stick with it. And I think that is probably why you're where you're at as far as uh, almost 111,000 followers. Yeah. I haven't had any just overnight success. Uh, once in a while people do. And so if anyone's mm -hmm. listening, you know, just starting to get into comedy, maybe you will hit the jackpot and and just be on on you know national television in in one year or something. But for most of us, it doesn't happen that soon, and you fall back on technique and and mm -hmm. practice and writing and always you know always getting better. What, what something that uh, a theme that emerged with my standup is you know sometimes I, I I remember looking around and going oh, I'm just not performing on any any of the the really good shows that I want to get onto. How am I going to solve that problem? Do more writing. I just always return to the writing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, are you are? Can you make your jokes funnier? Can you, can you both? Can you write new great jokes that are better than the ones you have? Can you also cut your worst jokes? Remove uh, the pauses. What can you know? Always, always film yourself if you can, or at least audio record. I audio record every set and listen to mm -hmm. it. And I go, oh, I made a mistake there. Oh, I forgot the word there. Oh, I, this this was a gap I didn't need. And so I'm always trimming and and reordering and tweaking. Mm -hmm. What's your writing process like for your stand-up? Do you have like a certain method that you follow or what What do you do? Yeah, so I pre-write everything. Uh, some people write on the stage or they're kind of casual with their process. As you might expect, I have a very specific process. Yeah. And, uh, I want to point out that you don't have to be so regimented if it doesn't fit for you. But, you know, it's nice to know the techniques and know the formulas to fall back on them when you're stuck. So mm -hmm. my process is I, I have a Google doc and, um, I, you know, every week when I have my ideas, I will often 
uh, voice dictate them into my phone and then, and then I listen to them really every day. The way I start my day is I listen, it's not that many, so maybe it'll be two or three minutes of listening and typing, but I listen to yesterday's voice messages and I put them into the doc. My doc has several sections and um, at the top is the sort of the inbox of the newest stuff from this week that I haven't even thought about yet, but it's just one sentence. It might be, you know, uh, the, uh, the, I don't know, the supermarket is, is weird because you're on the, you're on the aisle and why do they put certain things on the aisle and not in the, in the, uh, on the end instead of in the middle of the aisle or something, whatever it is, it's, it's there amongst the newer ideas. Then I, then I, I have, it's almost like a pipeline. So those new ideas, I, uh, often they need brainstorming. So for brainstorming, I'm usually looking for any other experiences around the original idea, any emotional connections I can attach to it. Um, questions I can ask. I think questions are a big one, like mm -hmm. not just asking myself questions, but literally on stage, you can introduce a topic by asking a question. Your whole setup can just be a question like, why do, why do we do this? Or what, why do people do that? Um, and then anyway, once I, uh, once a bit becomes more fleshed out and I'm, I write every word that I'm going to say on stage, it's pretty mm -hmm. much, I would say 95% the same on stage as the way I, I wrote it beforehand. Um, so I've got like brand new things, things that are brainstorming, things that I'm currently writing. And then another section, which is things to try at mics. And so every mm -hmm. week, if I go to a mic, I will grab the things that I've, uh, you know, that I've prepared to try at the mic and I'll try them and most of them fail, but some of them succeed and they become things that I'm now, Kind of newer bits but they're not virgin so they're they're um they're not i'm still trying them at the mics but i'm also trying them at the book shows and finally i have like my golden material at the bottom anyway what i what i've noticed is while i definitely like the google doc because i can't lose all my material the way it would, would if it was just in a book you can lose it all um, yeah. but i really like pen and paper i don't really like sitting at the computer i'm not that creative that way so what i do is i print the google doc i don't print the the old material that's gold that's never changing, but I print the newest, which is at the top, which is usually two or three pages. The the late, which represents the latest ideas from the last maybe two months. Mm -hmm. and I'll print it out and go to a coffee shop. I'll go to the coffee shop with my two pages, and like a lawyer or something, I will just redline it. I'll I'll say uh, this is good. Check this is bad. Cross out. Uh, move this up here. Move this here. And it, it's weird, but because I'm using a pen and paper, I'm able to just just rip right through it in a way that I wouldn't when I'm sitting at a computer. Sitting at a computer makes me just lose the whole humor. Um, I think, I, you know, once I'm done, I go back to the computer with my markup and I can update things. And that's easy because that's left brain. But the creative mm -hmm. part, the part that's brainstorming and thinking about funny ideas, I have to do that when I'm out at a, at a cafe, like in the sun, you know, really in a good mood. I don't want to be cramped in a dark room in a computer doing the creative part. Mm. I agree with that because i i work on a computer all day and when i'm trying to write out a joke it just it's not funny and when i look at all my best stuff it was all written on a piece of paper like before an open mic or something like that at least the the start of it and I, I think your advice as far as writing everything out, especially for a new comic, I think that's super important because that's the only way you're going to know between what you wrote and what you said on stage when you record it, what worked and what didn't work and what you can cut out. Yeah. And also, I think you want to start any new idea, limit it to just one or two or three sentences, try that at a mic and only extend it if it works. Mm -hmm. the Mistake would be to write 10 sentences. You go to a mic and by sentence two or three, it's not working, but you like told yourself, well, I'm just going to, I mean, if the audience isn't coming along with you, you're going to drag them deeper and deeper into something. So mm -hmm. I, I've learned to write things with the, the briefest uh, possible, just one punchline or maybe two, and then try it out before you add, pile onto it. But if it's mm -hmm. working, Sometimes you, especially if it's one of these things where it's like a, a, a list, it's like a joke, uh, uh, a joke off, you know, then you can mm -hmm. just pile and pile and pile more, more tags onto it. Yeah. Now you say that the, the writing for the TikTok stuff, because it's topical, more topical humor is different, but has that, the fact that you are making yourself write that on a regular basis, you know, 30 of them a week or whatever. What, uh, has that helped you with the writing of your standup? Oh, it definitely has. It definitely has. So it's, it's, I would say a small portion of those that I tell on the TikTok, maybe 
five to 10% of them do end up in the standup. Mm. Uh, I, I have this chunk in my standup. It's, it's roughly a third of my act, which is whatever the latest news jokes that I'm willing to tell in my standup are. I, you know, I think maybe the, the, um, I disguise it by saying, well, this country is crazy. And then I can go into anything. I can go into mm. odd, uh, weird crime news from Florida or, uh, stuff from the White House or um, Kanye and Kim Kardashian or whatever. I can, you know, this country's crazy is the kind of opener for that topic. And then I can rip through six or seven or eight news jokes or however many before the audience gets bored. It's just it's just an extra thing that bolsters my act, but it's not the real meat of, of the act, but it's just something mm -hmm. there. Um, but it's a very small portion. And basically it's the ones that the ones that survive, I think, are the ones that are about stories that very few people noticed because then I can keep them around for six to 12 months. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's about, uh, you know, if I do a story about Trump still being in the White House, ain't gonna work now. Right. So, you know, anything that's a big news story that everyone remembers, yeah, Jeff, that was like two months ago. Why are you still telling jokes about that? It's not gonna work, but right. um, like I have a story about, um, I say, you know, a uh, in, in, in LA, uh, or rather in California, they're debating a bill where they'll pay meth users to stop doing meth. And, you know, that would be nice to show up and you're like, someone goes, hey, you got a nice car. What do you do? Not meth. Yeah. yeah. And then you want to go back to doing meth, maybe you have to give two weeks notice. Yeah. So I did that. And, you know, they were debating that bill about a year ago. I don't even know what happened. Maybe it's law or maybe it's not law anymore. But I can, I can bring it up because most people don't even know it was being debated. So I can kind of always use that. Yeah, I like that one. I, I like the maple syrup one too. The uh, yeah. Canada getting it, and that's a fairly recent one. But yeah, I, I that can be used probably as long as you want to. Yeah. Uh, so so Canada had to tap into their strategic uh, reserves because of a shortage of maple syrup, yeah. which uh, I thought was funny. It's almost as bad as the great poutine shortage of '73. Yeah. If they run out of jam and jelly, they'll have to tap into their strategic preserves. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Now, as far as your social media presence, especially on TikTok, your name has gotten out there via that. How has that changed things for you? Well, TikTok has opened a few more doors for me with stand up. It's just one more thing that you can put on your little resume, not a real resume, but your little, you know, three or four paragraphs you said when you want to get onto a show. You can say, uh, you know, my TikTok videos have uh, this many followers or this many views. Um, but I would say that, that that some of those folks have come over and followed me on Twitter and Instagram, et cetera, you know. But um, here's what I think. I think you really need to uh, – the ones I focus on are Twitter and Instagram besides TikTok. Facebook mm -hmm. is really more for, like, small friend groups for me. I haven't found a huge public following from Facebook. But anyway, on Twitter – I will mostly type out my jokes as text, right? Mm -hmm. On Instagram, I often will take a screenshot of the tweet as an image, a square image screenshot of the tweet, and put that on Instagram. And those do well. Pictures mm -hmm. of text versions of the tweets. Sometimes on Instagram, the video version will, will do well, but um, those certainly aren't what they call posts. Those would be reels. Right. Instagram version of TikTok, right? And Twitter had fleets, but it's gone mm. now. Twitter doesn't really have first class like video like TikTok does. Mm. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I think Twitter is still in some ways my favorite. Twitter is a place where you can get just retweeted and you can you can interact with a celebrity. Um, it, it, it's to me the, one of the most fun platforms out there, even though I'm yeah. not a successful there as all the others. I had a really uncomfortable... Um meet up with a celebrity on Twitter, uh, Ed Asner before he passed away. And, uh, it was, I think I was tweeting to some hashtag like, um, uh, ruin a holiday movie by changing the actor. And I said, uh, put Ed Asner in Die Hard, And, uh, and he, he tweeted back to me <laughs> and he said, I think I'd be pretty good at it. And all of his fans 
just shit all over me. It was just, it was great. And there, there's no bad press. So I actually gained followers from it, but it yeah. was, it, it was, it was pretty wild. I was, I was like apologizing a lot because I, I said, yeah, I was actually thinking of you as Hans, Hans Gruber. Yeah, that's right. And, but yeah, it was, uh, it, that was, uh, that was funny. That was, that was, that's my Twitter story. That's funny. And you know, here's what I think about haters. Um, I think, Sometimes in my videos, I will get people who want to spread uh, like conspiracy theories about the vaccine or about the election or this or that. I can't stand mm -hmm. that. I block and delete those. But if someone comes up and they're like, you're not funny, you suck. I think that's great. I think that's signal. I actually consider them about the same as fans. It all helps my algorithm. So yeah. you know, haters is better than everyone ignoring you. Um, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know. It, it's also something once in a while I will take a haters comment and I will pin it at, as the top comment uh -huh. and then my people that I guess my fans will come in and defend me in it. And so it kind of is, is you know, it's, it's almost a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the weird, I, I'm always looking for ways to do, to, to get the podcast name out there. And i definitely don't have the work ethic you do to do all the, this video stuff. So I just started making memes about how shitty my podcast is and, and, and mostly because of me. So I just started, I started putting the memes out and then I put my little logo on, on there and Instagram is just blowing up for me. And it, it actually, I get more downloads because I want to see where the shitty podcast comes from. <laughs> That's great, Scott. I mean, uh, I think memes are, are uh, excellent format. I just love memes. They're so viral and they're so fun. And making your own memes that spread your brand, that's a, that's a great idea. That's yeah. A great idea. Yeah, one of them I'm doing now is I'll take a screen cap of our interview here, and it'll be you with an expression, me with an expression, and yours will be, how did I get on this shitty podcast or something like that? And mine will be, hey, this is going great. I love it. And, you know, it's... it's <laughs> So that's how I promote the podcast. So yeah, that's a lot of fun. Okay. Um, one of the things I like to ask everybody is, um, what is what, what's the best advice you ever got coming up in comedy? That's a tricky one. I, I don't know if I have any distinct memory of advice I got that's worth sharing, but I, I can answer the other version of that question, which is what advice do I have? Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I definitely think that, um, okay, I have advice for several levels. For a beginner who doesn't think that they can even do stand-up, mm -hmm. if you can appreciate stand-up, I think you can do it. If you can tell the difference, if you can tell me, I've got these favorite comedians, I love these comedians, I really love these guys and not these guys, uh, but I'm not sure if I can do it. Well, you're already curating comedy. You already mm -hmm. have the sense of taste for it. So mm -hmm. even though you're not generating uh, at, a, at a funny enough level, if you just generate tons of quantity of random stuff of all sorts of levels of quality and curate your own with that same, that same filter, that same lens that you're using to curate uh, the professionals, you will slowly accumulate material and slowly rise to have some. To someone in the middle, um, I mean, I don't have any advice for super famous comics because I'm, I'm still in the middle. But anyway, to someone in the middle, I would say, um, this is sort of a recap of all the things we've been talking about, but right constantly if you if you find yourself with writer's block ask other people what do you do for writing find writing prompts um read the news um brainstorm on your own personal life history or brainstorm on um controversial topics that everyone talks about be it mm -hmm. gun control to abortion or whatever be controversial be you know uh, tr uh, Think to yourself, there's something funny in this room and I have to find it. You always need to develop that spidey sense. And even if it doesn't, you're not feeling it that day, or even if, you know, you, you, you've never felt it before, you will get to a point where you feel that spidey sense that where you go, oh, I haven't found a punchline here, but I know something's funny here. And you got to mm. collect them and you got to write them down. And, um, and for, you know, social media, again, it's about consistency. Just, just uh, set yourself a goal. Just maybe you're going to tweet twice a week or whatever it is and stick to it. But eventually mm -hmm. you'll probably find, oh, I can tweet more often than this. Maybe I'm gonna try to tweet twice a day. And you start collecting things that you want to tweet later. And some of those tweets might be, you know, TikTok videos or whatever. Uh, just uh, just start, if you love it, then you can do it. So start, start it and don't stop. 
I, some people I think don't get into it and, uh, and, and fail at it just because they don't really truly want it or love it. But I think anyone who loves it enough and wants it enough can, can have some level of success, not necessarily skyrocketing success, but as, as you know, there's all these niche successes. There are all mm -hmm. these, there are, there are tons of podcasters that are mm -hmm. making a living on podcasting and yet, um, you know, they're not huge famous names. Um, so the, the, the world now has lots of room for medium levels of success. And I think that's amazing and wonderful. And mm. I think we can do that. I, that makes, that really, um, makes a lot of sense because the same thing is happening in music because you, there's fewer people being getting the superstar level than ever it's you know what what is there like 10 people on the top 40 or something like that so very you know adele's got like the top 10 songs or whatever the thing that there, there there was a um something that came out it's called a thousand true fans uh about uh kevin what's his name anyway the i'm sorry kevin rose yeah, that's it. Um, the thousand true fan things is a, that gives you something that you um, is attainable that you can build to, and w once you get those, every time you put a CD out, somebody's going to buy it. You know, they're going to go to Bandcamp and get it for you. Every time you come to their town or within two hours of their town, they're going to come see you perform. So I, that's one of the things I always aspire to is getting those thousand true fans and letting that build on itself because that's what happens. Yeah. And, and I think your, your TikTok success really illustrates that. Well, I don't have a uh, thousand true fans. I have a hundred thousand casual fans. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I put out a comedy album, even if I created TikTok videos to promote it, I, I don't, I'm not, I won't know until I try it, how many would, would dig it. But what I do know is if I create news jokes, sometimes they, the, a million people will, will, uh, will watch them on TikTok. So, I mean, you can't always get people to jump from one thing to another, but that's why I have a lot of irons in the fire. I got stand up, I got filmmaking, I got TikTok, and I got the newsletter. And, mm. uh, you know, you just keep, keep growing e each of them, you know. And also, finally, once you spread your wings into, or once you uh, have lots of irons in the fire and you've given things a, a, a full college try, if you're trying too many things, then just stop doing the ones that aren't working and focus on the ones that are. I, I definitely okay. did that. For example, I'm not really on YouTube that much right now. And I, I really, I was trying for a long time, uh, mm. but uh, I never really cracked the code there. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to focus. In fact, I turned my camera vertical because I was like, I'm yeah. going to go vertical. <laughs> so, you know, uh, after, after trying it for six months, I went, I, I tried it. I really did. Uh -huh. I'm going to go vertical. I'm going to go all in on TikTok. So that, you yeah. Know, yeah. Focus That's on work. And it's it's funny because you know YouTube's has got the those shorts now, but the thing is, I never I never think to look at it. I always remember to look at TikTok, but I don't ever remember to look at YouTube. I, I think people that are already uh, already have huge followings on YouTube probably do well with shorts. I yeah. think there's probably some people out there that started new in 2020 and did do really well with shorts, uh, but mm. I did, and there's probably plenty of other people like me that didn't. And so I really think TikTok's the best place. To grow and get new new people these days. Uh, I'm trying to think for you what you could do. I mean, maybe clips from this podcast could do well on 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 TikTok. Um, mm. But also sketches and you know, I, I never did songs and trends, but you know, you can always try those. Um, I have a friend who mostly does stand up, but the one sketch that he did, which was like, what if you know, Karen's the new the new. Mm. <laughs> Of, of the of the moment karen's he said what if being a karen the idea was what if being a karen was like a zombie thing that you could catch and so he has this zombie karen <laughs> sketch series that got him to a million followers on tiktok richard's wow. very funny guy um and it has nothing to do with his stand-up but then he put stand-up videos on there too and so it's he's finding that there's definitely this um kind of cross-pollination uh-huh it's it's funny i've got a few ideas that i've never really worked on hard enough to get get out there but one of them is portraying myself as a boomer influencer and and actually you know go one of two ways really lean hard on you know app applebee's appetizers or really lean hard hey boomers there's other restaurants besides applebee's so i've i've put yeah i i've put thought into it but i haven't put any action into it yeah i think that's i think that could work i i, I think um 
people, I, I know some people who get discouraged because they try one TikTok video maybe per month that doesn't work. And then what are they going to do? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think if you can find something, I really do think whether it's news videos like I do or something else, if you can find something that you can pump out, something real short and bite size and, and, and short and sweet that you can pump out two or three of them per day. And then after a week, you've tried 10 or 20 things, even if just one went viral, that'll give you an idea of what you can try the next time. So um, I like I like that idea, especially, you know, this Apple Boomer thing, especially if you're thinking you can put out 10 of these, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the hard part is taking time to write 10. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah. in my case, I have to write 100 to get 10 good ones. So th th there's a lot of work. You know, it reminds me of one more thing. Um, so I, I mostly uh, run this this weekly show um, in, in town, this live stand up show. And I've done monthlies as well, and I found them harder to do. People say, how do you have the patience and the uh, the, the effort to, to run weekly? Well, it's actually easier when you do it more often because of the, the momentum factor. Mm -hmm. And when you're, when you're at one show, you can say, next week, we've got so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and, -so, and those, a lot of those people come back again. So I think what I was going to finally say about your ideas for TikTok is you might find that it's actually easier to shoot more of them than it is to just focusing on, on one. So instead of just finding mm -hmm. one idea, shooting it and putting it out there, wait until you've got five ideas and shoot all five of them. That way you only have to set up your lights and your camera once and get five videos out of it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> yeah. Just put somebody in charge of my wardrobe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Change, change five different outfits and they won't know you shot, you shot all of them in one. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so this has been great. I learned a lot and I really appreciate you being on the show. One of the things I like to make sure that you get a chance to do is talk about what you've got going on and where people can find you. Cool. Well, uh, my name is uh, the easiest way to find me on various platforms. So it's Jeff with a G. So G E O F F and last name is Plit. It rhymes with shit. It's P L I T T. Hmm. So I'm Jeff underscore Plit on Instagram, Jeffrey Plit on Twitter and if you search my name on TikTok, you'll find me there, although the channel is called What You Need to Know. So okay. there are a few places, and please come uh, check it out. And also my uh, my newsletter. It's called the What You Need to Know newsletter, and you can also search for that on Google. I also link to it from all those platforms. Just go to my profile. There's a link in the bio there, and it's uh, once a week, uh, four of the most fun videos that I found and laughed at myself. It's not about me. It's about um, everything from stand-up to sketch to um, just – the funniest videos that I that I laughed at that week. And like Scott said, I, I really only say two or three sentences besides the video. So it's short and sweet. It's just a bite-sized uh, digest of videos. So come check it out. And thanks again. And thanks for yeah. having me, on, Scott. This was super fun. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed getting to know you. It was a good one. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Jeff.